Brother Jim, you want to reconsider and receive the offering now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be like Mark Twain said. He went to hear a missionary speak. And he was ready to give $10 to the cause. But the missionary talked on and on and on. And uh, he got it down to $5. <laughs> and uh, by the time the missionary got, got through and the offering plate was passed, he said he took out two dollars. <laughs> so that's why I say you better start. You better do it now. <laughs> well, to those of you who were at Jeffersonville last year, you know, I was a fill in. I wasn't one of the regular schedules, so I got promoted this year. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> My brother Roy wanted me to extend greetings to all of you who remembered him, and of course he sends his regrets, and I bring mine too, that he's not able to be here because he hasn't recovered sufficiently from his heart surgery, but he is with us in spirit, yeah. and uh, he appreciates very much the prayers that several of you offer on his behalf. Our subject tonight, for this point, is Jesus Christ, the means to the knowledge of God. I would Rephrase it just more simply, knowing God through Jesus Christ. Amen. And this subject is so important that I want to commence my part and to conclude it with that personal testimony of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 12, which you have announced as your theme song. I know whom I have believed. And am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Earlier this year, back in May, my wife Wilma and I made a trip up into northwest Tennessee, the very northwestern part of the state. Besides visiting relatives of hers who were ill, we also made a sick call to a couple who had been schoolmates of Wilma's as she was growing up and later came into my life in a very powerful way and were fellow workers for Christ with us during the 14 years that we were with Lamar Parkway Church in Memphis. A year after they moved in 1950, it was my privilege to immerse you in Christ. He'd been reared as a Methodist. And so I suppose he'd always had a faith in Jesus Christ, but he had not been immersed in Christ. Well, just two weeks after our trip to Tennessee in May, we were called back due to an untimely death in Wilma's family. Her sister was burned to death in a fire. And we also visited Hugh and Mary Ruth also at the time, and all of us knew that Hugh was dying. I mean, he was literally died. And uh, just at dawn, after we got back home, came a call saying that he'd gone to be with the Lord. Now, the way that Mary Ruth, after this night, was struggling with every breath on Hugh's part, she finally said, just, that's all right, precious, just close your eyes and go to be with Jesus and tell him that we're coming soon. Amen. Just like that. He closed his eyes and he's gone. Now, I don't want to convey the idea in any way that what I have to talk about tonight is knowing God through Jesus Christ is a morbid subject. Because to me, and I think to those who know the Lord, it is exactly the opposite. Amen. Amen. There is a joy that comes to the person who knows the Lord, who can say, I know whom I believe. Amen. And in the more familiar words to us in King James Version, I, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. To that kind of a person who knows the Lord, there is not a grimness that usually comes with the certain approach of death. Fear is swallowed up Amen. in that kind of faith. Now, the next to the last, just two weeks before he died, we were able, just as we did the last time, to share in the Lord like we always done. Just that precious closeness with each other that 
you know, you, you're away from each other, but when you go back, you're just right in step with each other because you've grown in your personal knowledge of walking with the Lord. And so you are walking with each other in the Lord. Amen. Hugh was a cousin, a first cousin, of the well-known Methodist preacher Clovis T. Chapel. We got know a lot of you have read books of his sermons. Well, they enjoyed retelling to us the time that Dr. Chapel came to their little country congregation and preached. And it was a custom there for one of the local members to read the text for the preacher. And so this elderly farmer got up and he used the King James Version, which you know has Roman numerals. And he announced the text. He says, I'm going to read from two-eyed John and one-eyed preacher. One-eyed Peter. <laughs> and of course, there was some laughter, just like here. And so he looked around. He said, well, I call him like I see him. <laughs> and you were upset that that Clovis Chapel just doubled up and the whole congregation did too. Well, folks, my subject here tonight may be, not be from one-eyed John and two-eyed Peter, but I'm going to call them like a saint because we're all terminal. Amen. We're all going to meet our Lord. We're all going to know Him one way or another. I want us to know him through Jesus Christ. And I know you want that from me and from everyone else. Shortly after the beginning of the 20th century, most of the families on both sides of my father and my mother came out of Baptist churches into what we call the Restoration Movement. Only that part of North Alabama was that time it's called Christian Church. Now, both my father and my mother were God-fearing, upright, devout. They were honest, filled with integrity. They were charitable. Now, that's the way they were. I'm not trying to paint them any different from what they actually were. They tried to serve God as best they knew how. They tried to instill in their four children a respect for the Word of God. They saw it to it that we memorized scriptures extensively. They saw it to it that we attended church as often as there were any services. They, they trained us to live moral, upright lives. Now, although my parents never went beyond grammar school themselves, they saw it to it that all four of their children went to Christian colleges. They saw to it that their three sons were trained to be preachers. So I knew about God all my life. But sadly, I didn't know God. Because there is a difference. Amen. Amen. I didn't know God Himself. As I indicated, I grew up in what was called in North Alabama at that time the Christian Church. Now, the nearest thing to a musical instrument that we had was a bell. And it was on the outside. <laughs> and it was rung before the services. So, about the time that I got up into the seventh grade, we made a remarkable discovery. We learned we weren't in the Christian church at all. <laughs> but we were in the church of Christ. But my grandmother on my mother's side was still at least I thought so then, but she was younger than what I am now. <laughs> and, and she would forget. And she would refer to it as the Christian church. And she'd be duly reminded, it's not the Christian church, it's the church of Christ. And uh, it, it was hard for her to, to get that fine distinction that to denominate it the Christian church is to err by giving the honor to the members, but 
but to denominate that the church of Christ is to give all the honor and glory to the Lord. But my grandmother never quite got that distinction. And now I'm getting old, too. <laughs> and sometimes I forget. <laughs> Looking back, I think that the mindset generally of my parents and indeed of my home congregation and to tell the truth of our whole restoration movement was pretty much alike. It is pretty typical in spite of shall I say a superficial uh, I'm being trying to be respectful here. But whatever difference over instrument and society and then something that's not so superficial and that's over the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the authority of the scriptures. But in spite of even those differences, I believe that the general mindset of all of our movement is pretty much the same, and I'll say why. I think this mindset can be best described in words like analytical, rational approach to truth. I think that we, in the restoration movement as a whole, and I mean this kind, of, I, I'm not meaning to be uh, judgmental and condemnatory, but I think that we have tended to regard, as I did as I was growing up, and my parents, and the congregation, that knowing about God, is the same thing as what is meant by knowing God himself. There is a difference. And I think the reason for this analytical or rational approach to truth comes out of our heritage. Our religious founding through the Campbells and their fellow restorationists is fairly straight out of the European age of enlightenment, of rationalism. It's sometimes called the Western mindset or scientific mindset as opposed to the Eastern mind or the mystical mindset. And I think that what this has done for us is to emphasize the rational or analytical ability of man. And so we have stressed logic as the means of knowing God. In our fellowship, in our entire fellowship, one of the greatest, if not the greatest sin is that of error. And so we have probably been quicker to condemn and ostracize those who believe error than those who practice some personal delinquency of morals because of this approach to truth, this kind of mindset. As an entire movement, we've been most distrustful of any kind of mystical experience as a valid means of identifying and knowing truth. In keeping with the scientific age, we have stressed the empirical that which can be observed, that which can be tested, that which can be repeated. If we take it into our laboratories, we would say, you know, we've needed some kind of a double blind kind of testing so that we can know that this really is a truth that holds and can be repeated. Our movement has deliberately disdained any kind of experiential knowledge. So as a movement, we have rejected, as a whole, we've rejected testimony, testimony, as a risky means of establishing verification of truth. You, you let in all kinds of errors that way. We have, you know, the better felt than told kind of experience. That belongs to people in error. Or at least that's the way that I would write. 
in our rationalistic hermeneutics, truth has always been proposition by its very nature. <coughs> Thus saith the Lord. That's been the watchword of our brother. And I'm not, not in the least sense trying to criticize that. I'm just trying to try to set forth why that our entire background has been based upon this analytical approach to truth as over against the experiential, knowing the God. Our boast has been, has it not chapter and verse for what we do? To back up, to undergird what we believe, what we practice, by thus saith the Lord. And I'm not criticizing that. I believe in it. That's why I have footnotes here when I quote passages of Scripture. For the most part, as I said last year, I assume that you recognize Scripture when you hear it. I hope so, because we've been, at least those of us who are older, I know, they've been brought up, uh, grounded in the Scriptures. But testifying about one's experience <coughs> simply is not and never has been characteristic of us as a fellowship. We don't trust testimonies because a testimony is subjective. And therefore, it's subject to whatever the person thinks. It can't be tested in an analytical way. We have placed our faith in man's rational abilities. Now, I want you to follow me. If you agree with me that we tend to depend upon man's rational ability to understand truth, then if our faith is placed in man's rational ability, where is it placed? You see, faith, just like a circle, can't have two centers. If our faith is placed in ourselves, what does this say about where our faith is not placed? If our faith is placed, if it's placed in, based upon Jesus Christ as our means of access to God, then it is not placed in ourselves at all. Amen. And this is a very, very critical distinction as I've learned as I've grown older. What I'm saying is this. To the rationalist, Faith is primarily the mental acceptance of a correct set of propositional statements about truth accompanied by properly defined obedience. But I suggest that to the earliest disciples of Jesus Christ, it, to those who had seen and heard and walked with, had seen him nailed to the cross, had seen the body placed in that grave, and then had seen the empty tomb and had met the risen Christ in their presence again, their faith was not based in a set of propositional statements about him, but in their experience of him. It was in one who could save them even from their own inadequacies. Inadequacies of behavior and inadequacies of concepts. Amen. Their faith was in him like the drunkard of old who met the Lord and changed about completely and the town atheist asking, you've heard the story, asking different questions about the Bible and such, and the old man gave incorrect answers. He said, see, you don't know much about this Savior, do you? He said, no, I don't. I'm sorry to say. But I know this, that whereas I used to be that my wife feared my coming home, my children ran and cried, and now they're all back to see me. I know this because he has come. Like the blind man that the Pharisee said, who are you to teach us? This man's a sinner. And you say he opened your eyes. He said, 
Whether he's a son or not, I don't know. But one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. Amen. To the one who has met Jesus Christ, there may be many things that we are mistaken still on. He knows our names. And he calls us by a new name, which is his. My name is forever joined with the name of Jesus Christ. And so is yours if you trust him rather than yourself. But doesn't Isaiah 8 20 say, to the Lord of the Testament? This verse used to be one of our choice slogans as we challenged others to debate. Because we have trusted the intellect and distrusted the experience, we've long been seen as people who are the most dogmatic as to the plan of salvation and the ones who are the most uncertain with respect to their own salvation. And this ought to raise some very serious questions about our biblical hermeneutics. Because our hermeneutics, you know what that is, that's just a big fancy word for saying the science of biblical explanation or interpretation. Because it in essence has been legal. We've assumed that the way to know God is through correctly stating and keeping divine law. So like the Pharisees of the first century, we've looked at the New Testament scriptures just exactly as they looked at the Old Testament scriptures. And that was to discern some law or some commandment in every aspect of every part. If we cannot find a law in what is stated, we will make a law concerning what is not stated. You know what Jesus said to the Pharisees of his days? He said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness to me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have. There's something dreadfully wrong in approaching the scriptures with a basic mindset which blinds us to the living presence of the very one to whom the scriptures were designed to lead us. To all who trust only in logic, those who know God through experience say, look, the very gospel itself is testimony. It is the experience of those who met Jesus Christ. Those disciples who witnessed the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ went everywhere telling others about their experience with the Lord. They declared, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. Incidentally, is it David, the one who has been saying Greek? What did somebody, I think, refer to someone who's being a Greek student. Amazing thing that in the, the Greek language here, these words are in the perfect tense. And just, I've been told that the perfect tense means something that happened, but the effect still remains. And so what John is writing here in 1 John, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we had heard and had not gotten over to it. Which we have seen with our eyes and not gotten beyond the powerful effect of that sin. Which our hands have handled and we still are affected by that experience back there, even today. He says, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testified to it. And we proclaim to you what we have seen.
seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Seemingly, our movement's favorite chapter has been the second chapter of Acts. But the second chapter of Acts is the account of an experience by the apostles in the working of God and a promise that others likewise could themselves experience the invisible presence of the Lord. The apostles explain that what you now see and hear is the beginning of God's fulfillment of his ancient promise to pour out his spirit on all of us. For some reason, we of the Restoration Movement have seen to deal that the second chapter of Acts is exclusively ours. And we've used Acts 2.38 as the spiritual for the bread and work phrase you use, sine qua non. That's a Latin phrase which literally means without which nothing. And, and that's, that's been the hallmark of our movement. Baptism for the remission. We're pretty well known among the religious world at large as the people who believe that without baptism, there's no salvation. You know what we mean by baptism for the remission of sins. We mean nothing less than a complete immersion of the body in water by the authority of Jesus Christ and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the conscious and express purpose of the forgiveness of sins. Otherwise, there is no that's why I term our understanding, Acts 2.38, our spirit for seven point nine, without which nothing. <coughs> it seems strange that we as a movement have been so meticulous and so technical about the first part of Acts 2.38, which connects baptism with the forgiveness of sins. And yet as a movement have completely ignored the last part of the same verse, which connects baptism with the perception of the Holy Spirit. How often have you witnessed baptism to the accompaniment of a statement, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, or for the forgiveness of sins? But how often have you also witnessed a baptism with the accompanying statement, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, if it's so fundamental for the first part, why not the second? Does this mean that somehow we value a legal forgiveness of sins more than a personal relationship with God? In our rational hermeneutics, is the forgiveness of sins merely a legal matter which is done in the baptistry rather than a personal matter which takes place in Does the gift of the Holy Spirit seem spooky rather than rational? Does the inward presence of the Lord somehow fail to fit into our hermeneutics unless that we limit it in a distant way to the apostles and to their writing of the scriptures? I suggest that our main focus has been upon the legal fulfilling of the Lord's commands instead of establishing a personal relationship with the Lord himself. Amen. Amen. This, this is what I'm trying to somehow convey. And I pray the Lord will help where I'm being weak. In other words, have we encouraged people to know about God rather than to know God himself? Much like the elder son in the parable of Luke 15, we have dutifully worked for the Father. But really all the while experienced a little intimacy with the Father and very little joy in association with him. And then when some prodigal shows up at the Father's house, we thoroughly resent the idea of immediate intimate relationship between the Father and such an unworthy we hear sounds of celebration, 
We're told about the father's embrace of the prodigal. But we repudiate the relationship. We deny it. We will not acknowledge that he's our brother. Not our brother. Such dealing with error offends our intellect. And we really become deaf to the father's employee. Our trust in logic makes us close our ears and deny the validity of what's happening. And so we fail to enter the intimacy with our father, which another son of his now experiences. All of us know that a home is far more than a house. It is the nurturing relationship of related members, of the one to the other. Why would a son remain in resentment outside the house when the father pleads, all that I have is yours? But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was lost and is found. He's dead. He's alive again. Why is our restoration movement not focused upon the reality of restoring personal relationship with God. Even when we speak of someone being restored to death, we usually mean, do we not, a legally correct procedure by which a guilt-conscious church member has, quote, complied with God's law of pardon for the early Christian, rather than the reunion of a real lost person with a real grief thought. The one is so personal, but the other is so cold and technically legal and impersonal. But what other relationship could there be between a criminal and a judge? In an adversarial relationship of courtroom, the two do not want to know each other but they want to know about each other. And there's a great deal of difference. If they come to know each other, what happens? In a personal way, by law, the judge is to remove himself from the case. Now, if through the only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to know the judge of the universe as our Father in heaven. What happens? Whatever case, if we are going to be tried as a criminal, it's going to have to be before some other judge. Amen. But there is no other judge. Amen. 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 When we come to know God through Jesus Christ as our Father in heaven, you see, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed us from the law of sin and death. Amen. Amen. According to the gospel, in Jesus Christ, God has come to us in our undone condition. He has not come as a sheriff. He has not come as a policeman. He has not come as a judge. To use biblical met met metaphors, God has come to us as the good shepherd, seeking his lost sheep. He has come as the great physician to heal the sick. He has come as the redeeming Gale, the Hebrew nearest kinsman, to redeem the lost inheritance. In Jesus Christ, as our nearest kinsman, Amen. God has come to us to redeem us, to restore us. But even better still, as the prodigal. 
receive us back. To put the ring on our finger, the shoes on our feet, the best robe to clothe upon us, to seat us at his table of feast. To have the personal relation. No longer is it the courtroom, but there's the living room. Amen. I say respectfully, but seriously, that our restoration movement generally has resulted in a caricature of Jesus. Because our hermeneutics is so centered in law, Jesus is perceived fundamentally as a lawgiver. Everything that he was and everything that he did is regarded ultimately as putting into force a new law. We talk about the new law, although the concordances not list such a reference. The scriptures refer to Jesus in many ways. They call him the Son of God, the Son of David, the Son of Man, the Man from Heaven, the Second Man, the Last Adam, but they never refer to Jesus as the Second Moses. And to those of us who claim to honor a law of silence, it seems to me that this should be significant. Far from being a second Moses, the good news says Jesus came, quote, abolishing in his flesh the law with his commandments and regulations. Amen. Amen. It declares he himself is our peace. The good news states, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us. And that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Amen. But to the legal mindset, this is all somehow still conceived to be simply the replacement of an earlier legal system with a newer legal system. It is not yet dawned on them that the very principle of the legal system itself was abolished in the person of Jesus. Amen? To so many, even yet, the new covenant is simply a newer code of law, differing from the older covenant merely in the repeal of some of the former commandments and the enactment of some other ones. But brothers and sisters, that's precisely what God promised as not being the nature of the new covenant. Amen. For scripture says, the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their weakness, and I will remember their sins no more. Amen. This prophecy, Jeremiah 31, 31, 34 is quoted word for word in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. And there it is specifically identified with the new covenant through Jesus Christ. Amen. The main point of the promise of the new covenant is it will not be like the old covenant. It will not be a once removed in law kind of covenant, of relationship. At Sinai, you remember, the people remained in the distance. They said to Moses, you speak to God, but don't let God speak to us. And so God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger upon stone tablets and gave them to Moses. Moses delivered the people, along with an accompanying book of the covenant with its rules and regulations of the priesthood. Moses presented these covenants, these, these Ten Commandments, and the book, and he said, do them and live, break them and die. Yeah. Now that's the principle yeah. on which the old covenant was based. But on the other hand, the new covenant is an altogether different kind of covenant. Amen. It is different not merely in appearance, but different in its very essence. It is a covenant based not upon knowing about God, but upon knowing God himself. Mm -hmm. It is not the presentation by God of another external law through the keeping of which one receives approval from God. Instead, the new covenant is based upon the great God of the universe presenting himself at Calvary 
in his son Jesus Christ for our approval of him. Amen. Amen. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Amen. One is to receive God's approval of us. The rule of God. The impossible The new covenant is our approval of him. What an astounding difference that is. God wants our approval of him so that we will accept him. What the Heavenly Father longs for is a personal relationship not a legal relationship. A relationship with dear children. The Gospel of John starts out by declaring that God became flesh in Jesus Christ the Son and we beheld His glory. The glory of the, of the only begotten Son full of grace and truth. And the Father's desire is that all people know and approve and accept Him in he came to his own, to that which was his own, but his own did not receive. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. The outstanding thing about the gospel according to John is the emphasis by Jesus over and over and over of the Father's incredible love and self-sacrificing desire to achieve an intimate, personal relationship with each of his children. The gospel declares that in knowing the Son, one knows the Father. And that's why the new covenant is in his flesh. The one who genuinely approves of Jesus Christ, the estrangement from God, is in him. And the sin question is set. In the upper room, Jesus assured, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Amen. John 14, 15. Now, he did not say, if you love me, you ought to obey what I command. Which is the usual way our legal hermeneutics interpret. But he simply stated as a fact, if you love me, we will obey. You ever say, if I were you, I'd do so and so. If you was me, you'd do such and such. No, it wouldn't. If I were you, I would do as you do. If you were me, you would do as I do. You see, what we come to have is the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. And by having the mind, If I love Will, I will do what she wants me to do as long as I believe that it's right and have the ability. Because I love That's the greatest constraining force that there is. Amen. Someone says, you know, if I believe like you, I'd just go out and live any old sort of way. Heavens forbid you miss the whole point. That'd be the last thing Amen. that you would want to do. If I love the Father because I've met him in the Son, you see, the greatest thing that I want to do is to do his will. Mm -hmm. That's why the one who was able to do it fully said that that's all we will do. Why another who was close to him said, For me to live is Christ. Mm -hmm. The living presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is our ultimate security. Communion with the Father through him releases within us the enabling Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God now is all fear of God's wrath. For he is our Father. And his love casts out our Nothing can ever come to the one who is God's child, which will ever be more than the Father can have. Amen. And he will have. 
such a one can say with the aged Apostle Paul, I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him against that day. My dear brothers, my precious sisters, it's a great thing for one to be able to say, I know what I believe. But it's a far greater thing to be able to say, I know whom I have believed. Amen. Amen. All the difference between trusting in what we can hold on to and trusting one who can hold on to us. Amen. In the other part of this talk, I mentioned about my God-fearing parents. They, like most of our church, assumed that knowing about God was the same as knowing God. And knowing God to them meant knowing God's law. Correct, complete obedience to the law was paramount. So they lived in fear. They lived in fear. My father especially feared death. So obvious. Whenever the subject came up. In 1976, as my father just turned 87, his youngest brother died at the age of eight. At that time, Will and I lived in St. Louis, which was 400 miles away. But we went down and spent a week with my father. And we noticed how quiet he had become. And my father used to be so outgoing, so fun loving. We thought that he was greedy, maybe even entering into a, a kind of severe depression. So we stayed over extra time to make sure that he got a physical examination before we left to go home. The exam indicated that nothing was significantly wrong, but two weeks after getting back home, my sister called me and said that my father was in the hospital in critical condition with massive cancer. I rushed back as quickly as I could get there, and which was around midnight. I went to the room and I spent the rest of that night with him. And shortly before dawn, my father asked me the question just right out. He said, Do I have cancer? I swallowed and I said, Well, yes, sir, that's what the doctor said. I'm just dreading how my father was going to take all this. He thought for a while, and then he asked, this point blank, he said, am I going to die? And I tried to be somewhat evasive. I said, well, we're all going to die. He said, you know, that's not what I mean. Am I going to die from this? <coughs> and I said, yes, sir. That's what the doctor said. He said, well, I'm glad that I don't have TV. One of his brothers, Walter, had died of tuberculosis. He said, if I had TV, nobody would come see me. <laughs> he said, I want to go home. I want to go to the hospital bed. And I don't want to put back in the bedroom. I want to put in the family room, and I want everybody to come see me. And so, But something more than cancer happened to my father. He met the Lord. He met him in a deep, vivid, personal way that was transformed. He came to know him in a way that just thrilled the hearts of his children. Now, now get this. My father, the one who had scorned better felt than told the testimonies of others. During these last two months, he just said it's too wonderful to tell. It's so wonderful. And he wanted everybody to know that. He who had never even voluntarily led a prayer in church 
and would not do it even his own dining table. Yet, in his weakening condition, you could just hear him saying, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Not to us. He was saying it to the Lord. But to us, just like a patriarch of old, and to all the people that came to visit him, God bless you. Can you imagine this kind of change that came about? You see, the more that his pain increased, the more he wanted to talk about his faith. And other people to share their faith. He wanted to sing. But not just any song. He wanted the hymns of deep trust and conviction and reassurance and those that speak about the relationship with God and the nature of the life to come. And we sang and we sang and we sang. And these helped him as much as medication did to lessen the pain. It was just one tremendous prayer meeting for the last two months. When he died at his funeral, that little church in North Alabama, that scarcely ever dwindled down to, even at their biggest occasions, 80 to 90 people. At his funeral, every pew was packed around the walls and the back, and there were about 40 to 50 more people outside that couldn't get in. This man who had been able to say, I know what I believe, had been so transformed by being able now to say, I know whom I have believed, that people had somehow felt touched by him in a way that stimulated them to want to be at those last services. Now, I purposely told you how my dad came to know the Lord. I could tell you about that glorious experience in my own life in 1953. Just to make it very brief, that going through an increasing awareness of the conflict between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, about the Old Covenant basis that we brought in, calling it the New Law. But in the midnight darkness, as I was praying to the Lord, and just got to the end where of, of talking to Him and just saying over and over, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, suddenly, the sweetest experience that has ever happened to me in my entire life. I met the Lord. My reaction, it's you. It's you. It's really you. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to experience the same way. I don't know how that other people do, but I just know one thing. Whereas I used to be able to say I know what I From that time on, I've been able to say, I know whom I have known. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed at the end. That's that Amen. And over a period of a few months, there was a recurring sense of this powerful presence of the Lord encouraging me in this attempt to deal with problem of legalism among our brethren, which has led to a great deal of marking and avoiding and excommunication, but I'm not ashamed. Because I know whom I believe. Amen. Amen. And I'm persuaded still that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that God. So, in conclusion, my brother, my sister, my question to you is, do you know the Heavenly Father through that sweet relation with Jesus Christ, which in itself is life eternal. No wonder it is upon this rock that Jesus builds such a community of faith that the gates of Hades cannot withstand. Now may the blessings of all